All right, good morning, Evansville. How are you? Come on now, how are you, Evansville? This is a cool place. You had a mayor talking about hip-hop line dancing. Come on. It ain't getting more interesting than that. I'm Charlie Guy. I work at IYI Indiana Youth Institute, and I'm so glad to come and join you today. We've been on the tour. We've been on the tour of all those sites, coming around and talking and coming to communities and talking about the impact of these issues on kids. And I got to tell you, I'm so excited. I don't stand still. So you have to get used to that. A little bit of energy is going to come into the room. Um, I'm excited because this is personal and professional for me. On the personal side, look, I've got three boys, ages eight, seven, and five. And we start school tomorrow. And so we're really excited about that. We're entering kindergarten. This is the first time in my life where all three boys are in school. Hallelujah. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> We know about early childcare education in this community. I know that's something you're passionate about. And I must say, when all of them three go to school, you get a pay raise as a dad. I don't have those costs. So I'm really, really excited about that. We call them Team Renegade, by the way. Everything I do, I think about those three boys. And I think for you, there are, there are children in your life that are really important, whether they're your own children or they're, uh, maybe you're an uncle or you're an aunt. As we think about these issues, we have to think about the impact it's having on children. And that's the perspective I'm going to bring. From a professional side, Indiana Youth Institute, look, we're a statewide organization. We serve all 92 counties to ensure the success of every single Hoosier child. And we work with those who work with youth to do that. So I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the state of the health and what's happening with kids here in Indiana. You see, we all benefit when the next generation is healthy, safe, well-educated, and economically secure. Health is foundational for everything else. If we don't have the health, we can't have the education. If we don't have the health, sometimes we can't have the safety. It's absolutely essential that health is at the forefront. And health challenges impact the whole family. I know that from personal. When the child is sick, it disrupts everything. So how are we ensuring that our youngest ones are healthy? We know it impacts the whole family. And I'm hoping that today we spark discussions that lead communities to take action. It's one thing to come here and sit for like three to four hours, right, and listen. It's another to take that information and go and do something about it. And so to do something, look, sometimes we talk about collaboration. And I think collaboration is really good and really important. But really at the root of it, it's like Casey. It's saying, hey, what are you doing? Tell me about it so that I can learn about it and then maybe give you some ideas, and then I'm gonna go about our merry ways. I'm gonna go implement that idea in my own context. It's somewhat self-serving, to be honest. What I want us to think about is the word convergence, which means how are we going to work together towards a common goal? So as we think, if we're gonna change these statistics and the outcomes for the Hoosiers, and specifically our Hoosier youth, we've gotta think about how we're going to do it together. And that's what I love about these roadshows. We're coming into communities, we're thinking together. We're thinking about how we can become partners, how we can become allies. And to do that, you have to know each other. So here's what we're gonna do. When I count to three, you're gonna stand up, okay? You're gonna high five, fist bump, hug, handshake. I don't care what you do. The person to the front, behind you, maybe somebody you don't know. And we're gonna say, I think our opening speaker said, let's do this, okay? So just go with me here. Let's do this. That's what you're going to do. Okay, you never know who you might meet. Okay, on the count of three, let's do this because we're going to do work in convergence. Ready? One, two, three. Come on now. Let me hear those. Let's do this. I like the virtual high fives from the distance. From the distance. All right, all right, all right. You've met each other. Five, four, three, two, one. You never know who you're going to meet. One time I did an activity similar to this. I met somebody brand new and it turned into like a 25,000 research grant. So you never know. You never know what's going to happen, okay? You got to work together. You got to work in convergence. So that's our framing. So now let's talk about kids. Here in Indiana, we have about 1.5 million kids. That's been pretty stagnant for the past couple of years or right around that amount. 34% of our children live in single parent families. One in three, wow. It's also important to realize that 20, nearly 27% of children are a race or ethnicity other than white. We're becoming more diverse as a state. And it's really important that we realize that. 
Not only are our children becoming more diverse, as you see here, 10% speak a language other than English at home. In our public schools, we have over 250 languages that are spoken. And we have around 12% of children that come from immigrant families. We're becoming more diverse, but so are family structures. Not only do we have one in three living in single parent homes, around 18% of children are living in a home with an individual as the householder that's not their biological parent. So it could be a foster parent, it could be a grandparent, things like that. And that continues to increase. Our family structures and our children are becoming more diverse. It's important for us to keep that in mind and in context. So let's talk about nationally, how do we stack up? So we know our statistics here. How does this impact kids? In Indiana, we've been, our overall well-being of children has been right at 28. We've been there for the past couple of years, right there in the middle of the pack. For families and communities, we're 32nd. Economy, we're 24th. Education is our highest overall domain ranking at 14th. And you see health at 31st. So health and families and communities are both our lowest rankings and below sort of the middle. Now let's dive a little deeper into some other in rankings I think are kind of interesting. If you look over here on our left, our highest five, you see a lot of things related to education and economy. You see that? You see that for fourth grade reading, seventh, okay? High housing burdens, we know Indiana is a fairly affordable place to buy a home and to live, ranked tenth. High school graduation, 13th. What's interesting about that, from 2007 to 12, we kind of saw a steady increase in graduation, then it kind of plateaued. Right around 90% until this past year, it dropped a little bit to 87%. So kind of interesting there about high school graduation. And you see math proficiency. Now we also know education has been at the forefront of a lot of state conversation and investment. And so what you see is the investment and then you see the outcome. So when we think about health, we see 49th in public health spending. We're getting the outcomes we're paying for in a lot of ways, okay? Now, if you look over here to the right, let's take a look at our lowest five. Child maltreatment, 48th out of 50. So what does that mean? That's neglect, that's physical abuse, and that's sexual abuse. We're ranked 48th out of 50 states in that space. Infant mortality, 42nd, child and teen deaths, 33rd, child poverty, 31st. What's interesting about child poverty, one in five children live in poverty, but one in seven also live in a working poor family. So those are those families that are just right above that level to receive benefits. So if you take the one in seven and the one in five, now we're talking nearly 40% of families living in sort of an economic disadvantaged home environment. Interesting. Child maltreatment, I'm going to touch on this. I think it's very, very important. Our child abuse and neglect rate has risen 52.5% over the past five years. And you can see this sharp increase there. This is what really puts it in perspective for me. There is a new report every two minutes. So let's think about how long we're going to be in here today, roughly four hours or so. Think about how many new reports will be, roughly 120 just in the time from when we started to the time we're going to end. We've got to think about these things. Now, when we look across all areas, this is a really important statement. There are clear disproportionate challenges and barriers, and they exist for children by race, place, income, and immigrant status. So it's one thing to look at the overall statistic, but when we start to desegregate that data, which is really important for us to do, it starts to paint somewhat of a different picture that I believe makes us more informed. It allows us to identify what interventions, what preventions, and where we might put them to have the biggest impact. And so I'm going to demonstrate that for you looking at the four areas that we're focused on today. And those four critical areas are impacting kids in a big way. So infant mortality, smoking, opioids, and obesity. Now it's also important to know that's not all doom and gloom that there are solutions. And we've heard about some of them already this morning with smoking, some amazing things like increasing the tax, increasing the age, and we see there are big benefits to that. But I'm gonna to explain to you a few other solutions that you can do at the individual level, the organizational level, and maybe some things that policymakers and leaders might consider doing as well. So let's jump in. The well-being of mothers and infants determines the next, uh, the health of the, gen the next generation. Indiana babies are 24% more likely to, to, die, to die before their first birthday than infants nationally. But when we break this out, 
by race, it starts to show us something pretty interesting. You see, black infants are 2.5 times more likely to die before their first birthday than white infants. So not only do we have an infant mortality problem, we specifically have a black infant mortality problem. So what are we doing specifically to think into that space? How is that changing our practices? And we look at preterm um, and born preterm and also low birth rate, we see the disparities there as well for black infants. So what are some things we can do over here in the organization community, the second check mark? What are we doing to promote cultural competence across the health workforce? As one example, how are we owning this space and what are we doing to specifically dive into this issue of black infant mortality? as one example. Now for smoking. The rates of smoking while pregnant in Indiana is significantly higher than the national rate. But when we desegregate smoking here by county, look over here. Grant County, 31.4% of mothers. Interesting, is the highest. And our lowest there is Hamilton at 2.4. So it's one thing to address it from a state perspective, it's another to make it really local. And say, what's happening in my local context? What's happening in Grant County? We have to think differently. What's happening here in this county? Then if we desegregate this by age, we start to see something else. So this is the percentage of mothers who smoke during pregnancy. It's, it's, it's by race and age here. And so we see, oh, okay, well, white mothers are actually more likely to smoke during pregnancy than black and Hispanic mothers. But when we break this out by age, those ages 18 to 24 are significantly higher. Now, again, this is also an age in which mothers are, people are usually having babies, right? But the idea is, how are we targeting this specific subgroups? How are we targeting the specific ages? It's one thing to address it overall. It's another to dive a little deeper into the data and say, what does this tell us? How can we find some wins? Now for kids, six in 10 Indiana high school seniors say it's very easy to get cigarettes. And around 37% have ever tried cigarettes. And when we look at this, we see that around 15% of high school students have used electronic vapor products. 9% cigarettes, around 5% cigars, and so forth. What we do see overall, though, is a downward trend with tobacco use in really every age group, 9, 10, 11, and 12th graders. That doesn't mean the work's complete. And we also know that with vaping and all the things that are happening, we may start to see an increase there, too. So we can't say, oh, we've got it together. It's a matter of being responsive to what's happening right now, too. But that gives us a little bit of a picture of what's happening historically from 2007 to 2017. So what are some solutions? Some things here, deliver culturally appropriate messages that target youth to counter tobacco product advertisements and reduce the advertising and promotions. It's amazing when you start driving around your community, you think, are the tobacco companies advertising to me? If you put that in your head, you start to see all of the places it's happening. It's really quite amazing. If you're not intentional thinking about it, do that today on your ride home. You'll start to see where it is. It's everywhere once you start to recognize it. Let's talk about the opioid epidemic. Oftentimes we think about kids as the hidden victims of this epidemic. They may not be the ones that are abusing the substance, but certainly they're impacted by the family members that are or being in a household where this is occurring. In 2016, we had 1,500 Hoosiers who died from drug overdoses. And the big thing here, this is the one that always hits home for me, Drug overdoses now kill more Hoosiers than car crashes and gun homicides combined. It's having a massive impact on our families. And it's happening nearly in all counties. And you see over here the highest counties. Overdose rates per 100,000. Scott, 71.6. Wayne, 42.1. Wayne is really important to me. That's where I'm from. I'm from Richmond, Indiana. I've seen this devastate my friends, my families, and my communities. It's happening everywhere. It's just not isolated. Okay? So what's the impact on kids? Prenatal exposure, obviously, interference with parent-child relationships, increase of child maltreatment, which we said was 48th. 
and substance abuse affects the whole family. Please look at this figure. In 2016, 52% of children removed from the home, for the children that were removed from the home, were removed because of drug and alcohol abuse. That is directly tying into that ranking of 48th. Some things that we can do as we're looking at policy, we've got to think about how we treat the whole family. It isn't just treating the one that is abusing the substance. It truly is thinking about what are we putting in place for the mothers, the fathers, the whole family, the children included. Obesity is our last area. One in three children ages 10 to 17 are obese. Now what's interesting is nine in 10 parents will say that their child is healthy. Isn't that interesting? Nine in 10 parents say they're healthy, but we know one in three obese. And there could be a lot of other issues that are going on. So what are we doing to educate parents? What are we doing in terms of stigma? What are we doing in terms of understanding what the true health issues are? Now the CDC recommends that kids 6 to 17 get an hour or more of exercise every day. An hour or more every day. But what's really happening? Let's take a look. When you look at that ages 12 to 17 every day, 18.9%. Our kids are sitting still. How are we getting them moving? How are we providing activities for them to be active and to be healthy? Our kids are sitting still, and this data clearly demonstrates that. And that is a massive indicator for obesity. Another area is child food insecurity. One in five children are food insecure. And you see over here our highest, our highest counties, Fayette, at 23.9% in terms of uh, food insecurity. So what are we doing to ensure access to healthy and affordable food? So if I have to sum it up on the state of the child, here's what it is. Number one, nationally we excel in few, we lag in most, but we have to improve in all. There's not one of these areas where we're just number one knocking out of the park. There's room for improvement. Do we agree? Yes, right? And two, there are clear disproportionate challenges and barriers that exist. And it's vital that as we do this work in convergence and together, we've got to think about the data we're looking at and how we're desegregating it by race, place, income, and immigrant status, at least, because it starts to paint the picture that we need to think about. And last, these four issues are certainly impacting kids, directly and indirectly because it's in all of our best interest to make sure each and every child is getting support they need to reach their full potential. So here's what I'm asking you to do, your action. As you listen today, don't just uh, listen, but take action. Work in convergence. And here are some easy things that you can do. Um, number one, communicate the, the, the key data and solutions. Promote access to your data and services and learn more. Don't let today be the end, let it be the start. Thank you so much for letting me hang out with you. It's a great audience. We're IYI, we've got lots of resources to help you in your work, and we'll talk to you later.